Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm your host, Dan Moran, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Adam Adato Sandel, author of Happiness in Action, A Philosopher's Guide to the Good Life, just published in September of 22 by Harvard University Press. Welcome to the show, Adam. Well, thanks for having me. So before we start, I have to give a shout out to everyone at Rutgers University in our 201 happiness course. We are studying happiness. And so I'm so eager to to talk to you about your book. So hi, everybody at Rutgers. And here we go. So let's start talking about you. Philosophers come in, in many shapes and sizes. And you have like a really interesting background that you bring into the book. So why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a philosopher. I've taught for a number of years at Harvard as a lecturer. I currently work as an attorney in New York City, in Brooklyn, and I'm a sports and fitness enthusiast. To say and the least. It, right. So, so uh, as part of this uh, enthusiasm, for a number of years now, I've been training uh, to set the Guinness World Record in pull-ups for most pull-ups in a minute, and I've, I've now set it four different times. And do you currently hold it? Because in the book, you talk about holding it and getting it back and losing it and getting it back. Yeah, I, I held it from 2018 to 2020. And then a guy from China broke it. I had it at 68 pull-ups in a minute. He got 74. So, you know, now I'm training to get it back. Wow. that's the, Well, that we're already impressed. So let's talk about the book, which is equally impressive. So I want to talk about your last sentence. So you end the book with this sentence, quote, Far from being a merely academic discipline that theorizes from on high and substitutes the abstract for the real, philosophy is an indispensable guide. So to what are you guiding the reader? What do you want to guide the reader to? I want to guide the reader toward happiness, toward living a better, more fulfilling life. And this is what philosophy really used to be about. If you go back to the ancients, to Plato and the dialogues uh, that feature Socrates as the protagonist, his sole question was how to live and how to be happy. So, you know, that's that's the the aim of the book. And my claim is that happiness is not simply a state of mind. It's not a feeling um, as we often think of it, but rather a way of being or a way of acting. So the title happiness in action really is meant to get at that, that happiness is something embodied in the way that we live and may not correlate actually to our mental state and at any given moment. Right. Because that's funny because I would think of the title, like when you read many books, you think of the title off and on and in and out. And and when I would think about your title in the times where I wasn't reading the book, I kept thinking about, okay, well, what what is what does he mean by happiness? Is it right? It's not a feeling. It's a, it's a it's kind of like a way of living or an approach to life. Is that fair? It is. And it goes back to the Greek idea of eudaimonia. That's the Greek word for happiness. And it literally means having a good demon by your side, um, a benevolent guardian angel, so to speak. So it's really about being on a path and being active, um, being led towards something that might be indeterminate, but but that that brings meaning to your life. Um, and it may involve struggle, and it may involve hardship and overcoming. And that's why if if you just sliced off any given moment of your existence, you might you know feel really stressed out, or you may be under immense pressure. But that actually, paradoxically, perhaps doesn't mean you're not happy because you might be engaging in something meaningful that's unfolding that you'll look back on and say, "Wow, you know that not only was one of the most meaningful moments of my life, but really orients and motivates my life here and now." Yeah, it's like graduate school or, or or doing pull-ups. I mean, right? It's the same idea. Yes. Well, you know, on the pull-ups bar, um, believe it or not, is where I've I've gained a lot of these philosophical insights and come to understand the words of philosophers like Aristotle and Plato. Um, it, and it, it's uh, it's funny you mentioned pull-ups because it's you know it's tough. It's it's painful to you know you're hanging and and uh, you know your muscles are burning. So. From the perspective of a, a feeling or mental state, you're you know you're not happy, and you know psychologists these days hook you know people's brains up to brain scans, and it shows the stress levels in the brain, and you know many claim that okay we can track happiness in this fashion, but I don't think that's right, and part of the reason I don't think it's right is through this this experience that 
you know, it's kind of a niche activity doing pull-ups, but I think anybody can relate to, to struggle um, and suffering in ways great or small um, that ultimately are, are meaningful and, and fulfilling and therefore definitive of happiness. And that's why the pull-up example is so great because it's, a, it's something you do purely for its own sake. Like it's not, it's not like this book isn't called like, um, happiness in action, colon, how to get a better job or how to, how to get to the next thing. Like the pull-ups is you and the pull-up bar and and that universe and that universe kind of like epitomizes kind of what you talk about in the book. Yes. Well, there's a a very interesting tension with pull-ups because on the one hand you could, it's very goal oriented, you know, you want to get more of them, you know, maybe you want to set a personal best or, or a record but beyond whatever goal you might have is the intrinsic joy of the activity itself, something that at least in my case, I do for its own sake. And drawing on that personal example, I make the larger claim in the book that happiness is not only about activity, but a certain kind of activity, namely activity for the sake of itself and not simply for the sake of a goal. Right. You talk about the relationship of happiness to meaning, you know, and of meaning to struggle. And that's, you know, those things have to go together. Exactly. And and I think this tension between defining the worth of our activity in terms of goals, how close we are, we are to those goals, um, whether we succeed or fail, and the embrace of the process or the activity as something meaningful in its own right is a tension that is always with us. Um, you know, I, I feel it in pull-ups, but in other activities, you know, writing a book, you want to publish something on time, you want it to be well-received, but, but more fundamental than that is, is the process itself of writing and of clarifying your ideas and the joy of, of just making something apparent to yourself that was kind of hazy before. Um, and that this process is, is open-ended. It's, it's never ending in a way. And it, it, there's something wonderful about it. And that's really what I want to hit home on in the book, that the kind of activity that brings happiness is activity for the sake of itself. And that really the struggle to live a happier life is the struggle to overcome this obsession with goals, reaching goals, completing projects, and to in fact, embrace failure as an opportunity for character development and self-discovery. Yeah. Let's talk about that because you talked about, you know, setting your goal on the pull-up bar, but also one of the biggest the takeaways I had from the book was the way you made me as a reader question what you call the goal-oriented society, right? So the whole time we're raised, you're told, you know, junior year in high school is very important. Then you got to go to college and it's the next thing, right? We're supposed to have goals. And you're not like, it's funny, you're not anti-goal, but I want to read something from the book where you, where you say this. You say, quote, rather than thinking of one's life as a plan to be executed, we should conceive a good life as coming to clarity and articulation through encounters with the unbidden. So that's a lot there. So what is this goal-oriented outlook that you think has, has kind of like, for lack of a better word, brainwashed so many of us and, and taken away our, our opportunities to be happy? Well, as you say, there's nothing wrong with pursuing goals. And in fact, it, it, it would be very difficult to imagine a life that that did not involve the pursuit of goals. I mean, we have to put a roof over our heads and we have to provide for basic necessities. Those are all very simple goals. And beyond the necessities, there are goals that are, are motivating and inspiring. The problem arises when we start defining our self-worth in terms of how close we are uh, to goals. And when we start defining, you know, what may, what, what will make my life complete um, in, in terms of success, an achievement. And especially when we start converting activities that we we really ought to appreciate for their own sake and that we probably began to pursue in the first place because we love them into things at which we might succeed or fail and you know take that burden upon ourselves that can be really stifling, especially as 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 we mature, we become adults and you know become immersed in a career. And it's very easy to lose, lose the joy of, of what you do uh, because you're looking around and worried about how other people will judge you, worried about success, you know, relative placement in a, in a social hierarchy. And that can be very damaging to, to our, our happiness and our freedom and um, 
really our agency uh, as human beings. Yeah. So do you think, to what extent do you think the goal-oriented society has affected what, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong about this, but it seems it's affected people in that fewer people have hobbies. I don't know if you ever noticed, it seems like fewer people have hobbies, just things they do for their own sake, right? Because the goal-oriented world is kind of like, well, what's that going to get you? Or what's the, what's the point of doing that? Or spending all this time on something just for its own sake. Do you, do you, do you see a conflict with the, the, the hobbyist and the goal-oriented society? I do. And I, and I think, I think, um, it's probably right that, that people have fewer hobbies these days. And it's also very easy to let the goal oriented perspective, even infiltrate your hobbies. You know, maybe you, uh, you paint in your spare time and, you know, you love to do it. Each stroke of the brush is, is a thrill and you're working out something that you want to bring to expression, you know, but then in the back of your mind, you're, you're asking yourself, okay, well, you know, how, how is this going to be received by the public? Can I get it into a gallery? So, you know, it, it, this goal-oriented perspective is very pervasive, and it's a constant struggle to to overcome it. Um, and but but overcome it, we must try. You, you know, it's uh, it's really it's really essential. It's funny because someone like me who does amateur podcasting, when you first start doing it, you know, a friend of mine have a podcast and it's kind of fun. Let's just do this kind of thing. And then instantly all the podcasting platforms start to sell you like ways to get your metrics. And that's kind of fun in the beginning. Oh, look, you know, 30 people in LA listen to us. And, and But then like you could see how you start to think about the numbers. And you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like we're, I, this is just supposed to be fun. It's like every every rock and roll documentary you've seen where someone says, you know, it used to be about the music, man. <laughs> exactly. So let's let's move on to another form. So if one one way to be happy is to is to see the journey and to not be caught up in this goal oriented society, another argument you make is that we have to have some sense of self possession, and that's that's about the first third of your book, right? So so tell the listeners like what is self possession? How is it different from self confidence? And why is it so important? Well, self-possession is one of the ways in which I try to get at the idea of activity for the sake of itself, um, as opposed to goal-oriented activity. And self-possession, I think, is a very fundamental virtue and that we lose it when we become obsessed uh, in achieving our goals, precisely because we're willing to sacrifice our own dignity often f for reaching those goals. You know, we constantly cater to people who, who belittle us at work. You know, we, you know, we kiss ass, we, we do things that, that we later kick ourselves for. Um, and we, we notice that our, our sense of, of self, of self-possession is, is kind of slipping away um, on, on this path to success. But Self-possession, um, it's different from self-confidence, and, and it's very easy to conflate the two. Um, self-confidence is feeling yourself competent in a particular domain. So, you know, capable of, of doing something, whether it's pitching a baseball game or doing a pull-up or um, making a good argument in, in court or um, doing something in a specific realm where, where you're adept um, and you kind of have a mastery of it, building something, you know, fixing the, uh, the, elect the uh, electrical wiring in a building and behold, there's light. You can be self-confident in, in, in many, many different ways, but self-possession is something more than that. It, it's about your attitude throughout everything that you do. And it's really at, at the core, I would say, it's about embracing life as a journey and being willing to assimilate what is what is um, difficult, what is foreign, what is threatening, um, what is oppositional, and making it your own through creative reinterpretation. And it's an attitude that's very difficult to to maintain consistently. And it's it's one that flies under the radar too because it's not it's not conspicuous it's not flashy in the same way that being you know adept in, in a particular realm might be, but that's that's how I would define self possession and it it has many different facets that I, I'd be interested in talking about and and one of those is being able to stand up for your yourself and exercise judgment against the various influences that that threaten to to disburden you of judgment, you know, when you want to get certain results. Yeah. Well, that's funny. You talk, so let me just recap that. So it seems like self-possession is like self-confidence is more, you know, quiet cousin, 
<laughs> like they're, 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 they're in the same family, but self-possession is, is more, is, like I love how you said it's less flashy than, than self-confidence. So one of the threats then against self-possession, which you just talked about is, you know, this idea of experts and that comes up in your book and you talk about how, you know, you say one of the quotes um, that I underlined many times is the virtue of judgment has fallen on hard times. And when I read it, it occurred to me that this isn't because we don't have enough experts. It's because we have too many. And you make the argument that, yeah, if you want a medical opinion, you know, you ask a doctor, but now we're glad to relinquish our judgment to all kinds of experts, even when these experts don't really have any understanding of what they're talking about. And I laughed out loud when I read your book because I thought to myself at one point, I, I was reading and I thought, this is like when Socrates complains that, you know, he went to the craftsmen who were good at one thing, but then they found that he was finding them pontificating on all kinds of things that they weren't qualified to talk about. And then bam, you tell that story. It was like a wonderful moment where our minds met. So, so let's talk about this for a while. I want to give you the floor. You know, what did Socrates find to be the problem with quote unquote experts and and how are these experts today a threat to our self-possession? Well, it's just as you said that experts, because they provide a, a service or a good that's particularly prized in a particular domain, like a doctor who restores health uh, and everybody wants to be healthy, uh, we, we tend to have immense respect for doctors because they give us something that we really want. The problem is that, that it's very easy to then trust the doctor, let's say, um, in, in matters that are really matters of personal judgment, a, a lifestyle decision that you have to make, that the doctor may very well, you know, give some seat of the pants advice on. And, you know, maybe you have a philosopher doctor, so his advice is really good, but, but much of the time you might not. And it's going to be some, you know, kind of moralistic admonition that's only with an eye to health. Like, you know, you broke your leg and the doctor says, okay, here's what you have to do to get it fixed. We're going to put it in a cast uh, or splint. You got to rest it. And then, you know, once it heals up, be careful. Like maybe you should consider not skateboarding so much or something like that. And you think to yourself, well, okay, that, that, that's not really doctorly advice. Um, that that's a decision that I have to make based on the, the importance of skateboarding in my life and how much risk I want to take on. And I think we can find many, many examples these days where we tend to naively trust experts, um, and outsource our judgment to them, uh, when we should be judging for ourselves. And, and when I say for ourselves, I don't mean, you know, not in consultation with, with friends and trusted mentors and, and uh, family members and whoever we might be able to turn to in our lives. Because, you know, after all, we are defined by our relations to other people. But judging for yourself, simply in the sense of assessing your own life, what, what makes a life meaningful for me. Let me read you something from your book that, that has to do exactly with this and get your reaction from it. So here's, here's a quote about this very topic. Here's what you say, quote, the experts flattered by the deference they receive and empowered by their mastery of a widely prized skill take greater liberties to pontificate from the narrow perspective of their trade on matters that have nothing to do with their technical knowledge. Their confident bearing draws in more and more credulous seekers of advice, and that becomes difficult to resist even for those with a good deal of self-possession. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, I, I think it's, it's true. We trust somebody yeah. because they wear a suit and a tie or a white coat um, right. or simply because they're, they're famous, because they're a celebrity, because they're a movie star. And because they have that status, we, mm. we t take what they say as if it, as if it were God's word. Yeah. Um, they have a blue check on Twitter or something. <laughs> That's exactly right, right, exactly. And and this is it, it's not to say that that celebrities and and experts can't also make very good points about life in general, but there's a real risk that we trust them simply because of their title or their reputation or status. Yeah. So we're living in the era of the hot take, and that's dangerous to our self possession. It is. <laughs> um, there's a great Simpsons where Homer Simpson meets um, meets. Uh, um, Paul McCartney and tells him something and he looks at the camera and says, rock stars, is there anything they don't know? <laughs> but Homer, <laughs> Homer, of course, means it literally. And you're trying to make us say, well, you know, just be careful who you get your advice from. 
Exactly. Don't don't become Homer Simpson. <laughs> That'll be your next book. Okay. So let's let's talk more about losing our agency. So you have a section about life sapping technology. Those are, those are your words. Life sapping technology, and you talk about how services like Netflix and Spotify they lessen our agency and our self-possession. So when I read that, I was right there with you. I, I was like, this is exactly right. You talk about how you know the algorithm learns what we want and it gives us more of that and that the recommendations we get from Netflix are, are in a kind of sense like they're fake recommendations because they're based upon what we already like. It's not like when we used to go to Blockbuster and have a happy accident. Right. And I've talked to other writers who have who have talked about the radio and how like the the radio now is gone. So you don't get random songs you wouldn't want to listen to otherwise. And every once in a while, here's something that's kind of nice. Right. So so I read that. What fascinated me about that chapter, though, that I that I really, really had to ask you about was what you talked about the GPS and about what the GPS is doing to our agency, because that had never occurred to me in a million years. So can you can you tell our listeners about how the GPS comes up in your in your Argument about self-possession? Well, the GPS is ubiquitous these days, and, and I fall guilty to Me this too. charge all the time. You know, you look at the blue dot on your phone as you're walking down the street, and it tells you whether to turn left or turn right. You've got it up in your car. And there are certain circumstances when you would cer- when you would want a GPS. You're rushing somebody to the hospital, and you need to get there as fast as possible, and that goal really matters. So you're not going to wing it. You're going to you know, unless you know the route, you're going to look at the GPS. But the the problem is that we trust the GPS. We rely on the GPS all the time. Um, at least I catch myself relying on it way, way too much. And what we lose is the ability to interpret our surroundings and to find our way around in the world. And I think that loss actually implies a loss of responsibility for the world around us as well, because we lose appreciation for landmarks, for the the layout of a city or a countryside through which we're driving, uh, because we're we're simply following the you know the the route that that Google tells us to follow, and you know some might say, well, this is this is wonderful because it liberates us, you know, to just gaze out the window and and uh, appreciate without having to worry about which way to turn. And and maybe you can take in the scenery better that way. And I'm skeptical of that. I mean, in principle, it could be true. But I actually think that a concerned attention to one's surroundings, when you really are kind of lost and have to find your way around, or you don't know the route, so you, you used to open up a map and look at the map in advance, and you would have to interpret the map, you know, that, that there is really something to that. And, and, you appreciate your surroundings more, you know, when you when you're looking at the map and you see, okay, there's there's the indication that there's going to be a mountain on my right, and then the exit on the highway is going to be, you know, just a mile or so after that. It, you know, you know what I mean. You you I have a you yeah, it's it's it triggers your imagination right. because you know a map is not the same as GPS, even though it's one could say it's a technological step in the direction of GPS, but it it's really fundamentally different because it engages your agency and imagination in a way that the blue dot on GPS simply doesn't, or the voice that just tells you where to turn. Um, and I do think that that this is this is a real loss. And and if I may uh, uh, offer an anecdote from from growing up when I was in school, when I was in seventh and eighth grade. I had a fantastic history and geography teacher. And one of the main things that we had to do was to make maps. And we would have these great big sheets of, of mylar, you know, like uh, four by four feet or something like that. And, and we, would, we would unfurl a, a, a map and we would trace over it. And we would have to then find cities and rivers and, and mountains. And, and uh, we would have to adorn the map with, with local, uh, you know, wildlife maybe or historical sites. And you really gained an appreciation for the world that I think is, is lost in, in our <clears throat> technological age. And, you know, I, I, I don't mean so much to be dismissive of technology as to point to the trade-offs that it involves because obviously GPS is is very good for for efficiency of travel and I don't want to dismiss the merits of efficiency but there's a real problem when efficiency crowds out 
the understanding of self and world that we gain from having to find our own way around. Yeah, like you said about efficiency, right? Is is you know the the downside of something like Spotify is you have fewer happy accidents. But at the same time, like I love it because if I want to hear a certain thing, you know, I could listen. You know, it's right there. And so it, there's it, it, trade offs is a great way to describe that. Yeah, it, it's a trade off, and I think we lose we often lose the sense of trade off. It's also funny what you said about GPS is is that people will still leave them on even if they're going to a place they know they're going because they just want to see what time they're going to get there. Do you ever notice that? Or I want to see what the traffic's going to be like. And it's kind of like, well, you can do it without, you know how, it's going to take you 20 minutes like it takes you every day. But it's kind of funny that like it's become like a, almost like, a, a, like, a, like putting your seatbelt on. It is. <laughs> um, it's funny too what you said about seventh and eighth grade because I remember my my dad used to say, you know, this is he, you know, he passed away like a, probably around the era of MapQuest. But um, to his generation, you should know all the roads around your house, and you should be able to use compass points. And he would say things go, you know, east on on you know the five sixteen, and and they they all just assumed that you could just do it or look at a map if you had to. The idea it was almost like like a GPS would have a GPS would have been beneath them. <laughs> yeah, there's something admirable about yeah. that. Well, it's good. Yeah, and you talk about Odysseus as as the ultimate, you know, character in literature, right? Who who just certainly doesn't have a GPS. He knows where he wants to go, but the point is that going there is the point, right? So so what is it about Odysseus that you use him several times in the book? You know, why is he such a great figure to draw upon for your argument? Odysseus is the paradigmatic adventurer. Right. And he's got a goal. He wants to return home after this victory in the Trojan War. And, and he's on his way home. And then all of these misfortunes befall him because of the, the wrath of the gods. And he finds himself on this journey that that we uh, that is handed down to us by, by Homer in, in the Odyssey. And one thing that I find very compelling about the story of Odysseus is, is – precisely that the the journey is what's of interest. Um, it begins in the middle of things. And although he wants to reach home, it's really about what he, what he learns of himself along the way. And it's about how home, the very meaning of home gets redefined in light of the struggle. So on the one hand, he's returning to the same home in Ithaca, but on the other, he is returning with more, that Ithaca takes on a new meaning. It resonates in a different way because you know, your beloved wife, Penelope, to whom you return home uh, after resisting the call of the sirens and fighting these monsters like Scylla and Charybdis um, is the same wife, but but your commitment to, to, to your wife in that circumstance is, is different. It takes on a new weight, a new meaning. And so there, there is this, um, there is this intrinsic character to the journey that that defines the end so the end can't be separated from the path to reach it yeah it's it's not just a literal odyssey it's the yeah, it, that's that's a big part of your book is that's the it's the journey you go on you know philosophically you know as you go through time um all right, let's switch gears for a little bit because as, as somebody who loves film as much as I do, I, I can't resist bringing up some of your movie readings in, the, in this book, which I think are terrific. So um, I want to talk about the first one. When you talk about greatness of soul and you talk about Aristotle, what Aristotle called greatness of soul, you decide you're going to illustrate that with The Apartment, the great comedy by Billy Wilder. And in that movie, um, to let our listeners know, in case they don't know it, Jack Lemmon is this, he's a, a figuratively and literally small man named Bud Baxter. He's hes a nobody at this company who lets all of the executives use his apartment as kind of like their love nest for all their illicit affairs. He has to wait outside until they're done. His job is to supply with liquor, empty the ashtrays. I mean, he's really, really um, you know, being used there. So what lesson do you give the readers about about greatness of soul and, and that movie. Well, it's a great example of 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 how he's so craven for a promotion at this big impersonal firm that that he's willing to utterly sacrifice his dignity and relinquish his own home. And you know, one night he's sleeping out outside yeah. in the cold on a bench, and he comes to work the next day with an 102 degree fever or whatever. And uh, you know, he just takes a beating day in and day out in hopes that that he's going to be promoted. Um, and, uh, so it, it's a great example of, of what Aristotle would call smallness of soul in contrast to, to greatness of soul, greatness of soul, um, 
indicating a, a self-possession that leads you to stand up for yourself. Um, it, it's also a good example of, of how virtues can have, have two faces to them, like to the virtue of generosity. Uh, it, it can be born of greatness of soul as, as when um, the, the, the generous act, the gift we give um, bestows something upon someone in a way that, that benefits them and also empowers us or gives us a kind of sense of personal fulfillment thinking, you know, think of teaching or mentoring right. where what you give uh, not only benefits somebody else, but actually brings you fulfillment because you're passing on knowledge or passing on an activity that, that gives meaning to your own life and you're seeing it develop and grow in somebody else. So that would be a kind of generosity born of greatness of soul because it uh, is very much tied to your own sense of self and purpose and meaning. But then we we can think of many instances of generosity where you give things away out of a kind of compulsion or a kind of guilt where, where you you throw everything away and lose yourself in your generosity. And I think the Bud Baxter example from the apartment is, is probably one of the most extreme versions yeah. of that where in a sense he's generous, but in this very, very... Um, demeaned way where where he's yeah. stocking the drink trays and and throwing out the the cigarette butts of, of these philandering uh, upper management and guys has, and it's great the great thing about the movie is he has his own odyssey as well because the movie that you know the tension of the movie is he doesn't stay that way he kind of he has to learn not to be that guy right and and that's the the beautiful thing about the movie and yeah. and uh how it winds up yeah so let's let's talk about some other movies so in, in your you also talk about the third man and the godfather to talk about friendship. And you talk about, you call, quote, you say there's a modern bias against friendship in favor of justice. So let, let's move on. Let's have a conversation about that. We'll talk about some movies as well. But what do you mean by there's this modern bias against friendship in favor of justice? Well, this bias comes from two directions, and both of them have roots going back to the Enlightenment. So very deep roots, you know, 18th century thought. Um the first idea is that universal concern um, is at odds with particular concern, particular concern for your family, your friends, your your country. That that really what what it is to be moral is to take equal concern for everybody, you know, regardless of where they live in the world, regardless of whether you've ever met them, regardless of their relation to you, and that this is really the apex of an enlightened moral consciousness. And that, that friendship is is really only a kind of limited good at best, and at worst is a kind of tribalism, you, you know, that, that detracts from universal duty because you give your friend special treatment and Today, when we denounce um, favoritism, nepotism even, it, it grows out of, of this enlightenment ethic, very familiar idea that, that we really um, shouldn't be giving special favors to people simply because they're close to us. Um, and to some degree, that might, that might be true, but where I think this, this way of thinking goes wrong and why, why I call it a bias is that it really demeans the particular attachments that give our lives um, meaning. And it also neglects what I would say is a fundamental connection between the particular and the universal so that really we only learn to respect humanity in general, that person on the other side of the world who we've never met and probably never will meet through the way in which people close to us, namely our friends, our family, maybe our fellow citizens, um, the, the way that, that we care for them and they care for us so that the, the, these particular loyalties are what um, educate us uh, in a more universal concern that you can't really have uh, one without the, without the other. Um, and that works in both directions. You know, if you're a thoroughly unjust person, you know, who's who's just crudely egoistic in the sense that you care about, you know, money and accomplishment and you're willing to screw over anybody, you're, you know, you're not going to have friends. So yeah. the, the universal in particular go together. But I would say there's a further point and perhaps even a, a subtle and more deeper point um, that, that feeds into this modern bias against friendship that also goes back to the enlightenment. And this is the idea that we rise 
to our highest calling as human beings, as agents of progress. Now, the idea of progress, providentialism, but also a progress that we human beings bring about, um, you know, the ideal world, and that gets articulated in many, many different ways, but um, you could say a world that is more just, a, a world that is more technologically advanced, a world that is is happier or freer. You set you you've set up a goal to be reached, and you think you know what it takes to reach it, and that becomes the ultimate calling in life. It's the goal oriented perspective writ large. And if that's your way of thinking about things, friendship takes a back seat to alliance. And an ally is very different from a friend. An ally is somebody who will help you on that path to achieve your goal. But a friend is somebody who picks you up and helps you in the struggle when your goals fall apart. And I think what what this strand of modern thought misses is the, the vulnerability of all goals in all states of the world, um, no matter what our accomplishments, no matter what the scale that there is a kind of open-endedness to life that, that makes all of our achievements precarious. And if that's the case, there will always be a very deep need for friendship. And that's what the, the ancients recognized uh, and, and is reflected, especially in ancient Greek tragedy, that no matter how well-intentioned you may be and no matter how noble your goals may be, that uh, things can fall apart in terrible and unexpected ways. You know, the Oedipus story, he's, right. he's the most well-intentioned man and, and, uh, and he ends up killing his father and marrying his mother by sheer accident. So in a world ridden with these unexpected twists and turns of fate, what really makes life worth living and redeems life is friendship. And that gets lost when, when, you, uh, when you understand life in terms of progress towards some grand goal. Right, because if, you, if, if your life falls apart, you won't have your allies because the allies were part of that goal. They were like baked into that, that goal seeking cake, right? But then if, you, if things fall apart, you know, you will, have, you will have your friends, your family. Exactly. All right. And friendship also resists this, this whole, all the assumptions of the goal oriented society we spoke about earlier, because friendship is like, it's like the pull up bar, isn't it? It's like this thing that exists for its own sake. Like you, you're kind of like you're, when you're born, you, you're told who your parents are, this is your family, but that's, you know, your friends are, friendships are voluntary. And as you point out in the book, they, they, they exist for their own sake over time to, to develop the shared history. Yes, and in a sense, you could say that friendship, in the highest sense, is useless, and beautifully it, useless, right? Beautifully useless. Beautifully <laughs> useless, yeah. in the sense that it is, it's um, one could say beneficial in a very special sense, and in the highest sense, where what you quote unquote get out of a friend is not some achievement, not some advancement, not some particular thing, right. but rather a stronger sense of self and greater wisdom through living together and bucking each other up and having each other's back and having discussions and counseling each other and working through tough times. And so friendship really uh, is part of this process of, of constantly redeeming your past and opening a, a future. And it's ongoing in a way that a goal-oriented activity is not. Right, because you can't list your friends on your resume. <laughs> no, right. That's not. It's. it's a, but I love how you said like it, it's useless, right? And and that's also why um, it's funny. Like, so what about how social media has taken the verb the, the friend and the see of how many friends you have and followers and, and and LinkedIn people have connections, right? So do you see like a corruption of this idea through social media? For sure, and I, I think we all understand on a certain level that our social media friends aren't true friends. But the very fact that we use the term friend right. and, and that it – for this very um, kind of uh, superficial or instrumental relationship, you know, counting up how many friends we right. have. Um, I'm going to friend you. <laughs> I, I'm going to friend you. Right. It, that in itself is very interesting that we use yeah. the term friend right. so unthinkingly <laughs> in, in that way. And right. it, it does speak to this uh, hollowing out of what friendship really means. Yeah. Let's do another movie because on the subject of friendship, you offer a long reading of a, of a second great Billy Wilder film, 
and that's Double Indemnity. And you talk about how that film was very much about friendship. Now, this is, I, I, you know, that's one of my favorite movies. I've seen it a thousand times. It might be the last movie you think of when you think, so, so what's a great movie about friendship? I think a lot of people wouldn't put Double Indemnity up there at first. It wouldn't occur to them at first because, you know, that movie is so razor sharp and cynical and dark and, and uh, for all the reasons we love it and that everybody still loves that movie today. But what does that movie, that that dark, you know, crime thriller, tell us about friendship? It's it's a great question, and I had to watch it a few times. I, I love the movie too. It's 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 always really struck me, and so I watched it many times. And and after thinking about why I liked it so much, I came to the conclusion that paradoxically, it's one of these rare films that really celebrates friendship of all things. And it's, of course, not apparent on the surface because it seems to be about about this insurance salesman, Walter Neff, murder. you know, <laughs> you know, 30 something, maybe 40 year old guy kind of dapper, but but, um, you know, utterly st- mired in malaise. And, uh, you know, he works for a kind of an impersonal firm and he's going door to door and getting shut down, try- you know, trying to sell people insurance. And then he falls for this classic femme fatale and, you know, she, she gets him to, to knock off her wealthy husband with her and then she and ends up betraying him in the end. So it's this very, you know, classic film noir. But what really intrigues me about the movie and why I think it's a celebration of friendship is the byplay between uh, Walter Neff, this, this dapper salesman who goes down the path of self-destruction, and his, his colleague, Barton Keyes, who's, who couldn't be more different from him on the surface, right. who's this brilliant false claims investigator who works for the firm. And, you know, he, he's everything that Walter isn't, you know, he's short and stout and, and kind of ugly and, and, but brilliant. He's got this mind that won't quit. And, and he's got this forensic intelligence that that's uh, quite impressive. And uh, he's always sick to his stomach because he's trying to get to the bottom of the false claims cases that he always solves. And, you know, Walter Neff's out on the road to, trying to sell insurance and, and smooth talk people into to buying it. And they couldn't be more different, but they're all, they're such good friends and and you see it throughout the show that rather the movie the that um it, it, that's and it's epitomized in this this gesture where 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 Neff will will light the cigar yeah. of of keys and and, and uh, they'll kind of make fun of each other but they really appreciate what what each what each does they have a, they have a shared history they do that. they have yeah. exactly a shared history and then in the end of the film of course, um, of course, Neff has has had to really try to dupe his friend into uh, to thinking that that this this murder and the insurance claim attached to the murder was done by somebody else, and and he almost and, and he basically does fool him in, until the very end when uh, when uh, Neff confesses of his of his own accord ultimately when things go wrong to Keys and. Uh, they have this reconciliation at the end, and, and so it's actually quite a sentimental, a heavily sentimental film, I would say, but a sentimentality that really works because of the dire circumstances that, that form the backdrop. Yeah, because when Neff is dying, he says to Key, and that's it's Frederick Murray is Neff, and Eric Robinson is um is um oh he's key, yeah is Keys, and you said they physically look totally alike, and and you know at the end Frederick Murray is is there dying, and he says, see, he was right in front of you. And then, and then Key says, "Closer than that, Walter." Yeah, <laughs> you talk a lot. You talk a lot about that line, right? Yes, I and and uh, right after that, I believe is is when uh, Keys in a reversal of roles yeah. lights, lights the final cigarette that Neff will smoke. Yes, yeah. And Neff says, "I love you too, Keys." Yeah, yeah. And so you know, I love you. It's it's the most sentimental expression, and in many settings would be a totally corny line. Yeah. But in this movie, it's absolutely brilliant and quite moving and quite an affirmation of friendship. Yeah, it's brilliant because it's 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 you know Neff gets to have his cake and eat it too because he's he can be a wise guy. I love you too, but at the same time, like he really does love him, like it, and he really does have a profound feeling for for Keys. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great. So you you know, kudos to you because I, I, when I read that section of the book, I was like, oh, this is dynamite. This is dynamite. So, okay, so that's friendship. Let's let's move on to nature. Nature's another point of, of making us happy. You say that nature should be quote a potential partner in dialogue as we strive for self possession. 
Now that that might be um, out of, that's out of context, but that could be the classic sentence that somebody who raises his eyebrow at philosophers says, "Oh, come on, what does that even mean? Like, nature's a potential partner in dialogue as we strive for self possession." What do you mean by that? It's a potential partner, and how do we make that partnership happen? Well, let me start by a personal example to try to to clarify that. I was on a I, I was on a run one day, a hard run. It was actually a track workout with a with a running club. Um, <laughs> And it was like, it was one of these really tough summer workouts and I hadn't hit the times I'd wanted to. And I was, you know, you feel kind of lightheaded, sick to your stomach. And I was jogging home feeling kind of dejected as I was jogging home. I saw to my right, a, a tree that had been cut down very recently, pretty recently, at least, you know, a big fat tree trunk sawn, you know, clean at the base, but from the middle of this trunk, almost miraculously were these green shoots now about four feet high springing forth from this this trunk and i just stopped and and looked at it and i i said wow you know this tree had probably stood a hundred feet tall and had broad branches and you know it was cut down by by human hands and look now you know when you you thought it was totally done it's it's springing back to life and it it made me pause in part, I think, because I was thinking of my own life and my own dejection at that time. And I thought to myself, you know what? Tomorrow begins a new chapter. Let's pick yourself up. Let's go running again and and hit the times that you didn't hit today. Um, and so this is what I mean by nature, having something to to teach us of our own lives. And this interpretive uh, attention to nature gets lost, I think, in a technological orientation to the world. When we treat nature as mere resource uh, for our for our purposes, you know, a tree is used for timber to, um, you know, build houses. Uh, so we, we can clear away all the, the trees we need to build all the houses we need and not think twice about it. And this kind of thoughtless uh, appropriation of nature um, for, for our, uh, for our, our own particular purposes. I think it's very damaging, not, not only to the natural world. I mean, people talk about that, you know, conservation and global warming and the health of the planet. So there's plenty of discourse on that, but the point I'm trying to make is very different that what we really lose is, uh, is an appreciation for nature as a symbol or as, as a, interpretive prompting for us to understand our own lives and to um, be more self-possessed. Yeah. You talk about, I mean, you give examples of a waterfall of, of thunder and lightning in the book, and it's almost like you want us to have a, like, a, you, you, it's funny you said you're, it's not a conservationist argument, although that's in there. It's about, it seems to me you want us to have a Socratic dialogue with nature. Is that fair? Yes, and and the the very impressive thing about what Socrates did when he would speak to people and have discussions with people is that he had this knack for being attentive to what they said, and even in the most seemingly shocking opinions or oppositional opinions, like when he's talking about justice with some arrogant order, and and this order says, you know, justice, there's nothing to justice, it's just might makes right. Justice is whatever is good for the stronger, for the ruling class. That's what's just, you know, a kind of very, uh, you know, hard, (laughs) hard nosed, uh, cynical view of justice. And instead of saying to this guy, you've got it totally wrong, Socrates would would really pay close attention and, and ask him questions that really started from a point of acceptance, at least a kind of quizzical acceptance, you know, well, if you say justice is really what's good for the stronger, what does it mean to be strong? And don't strong people sometimes make mistakes about what's in what's to their advantage. And when they make mistakes and order people to do things for them, that will contribute to the mistake, is it just to do that? Because then it will work out being to the disadvantage of the stronger. See, in a, a, anyway, I digress a bit, but but Socrates had this attentiveness and a, a critical eye combined. And I think we should adopt the same stance toward nature, that we should really be attentive to nature and recognize that even in the more threatening aspects of nature, hurricanes, floods, illness, 
uh, are lessons we can learn. Uh, th- these aren't simply things that we should strive single-mindedly to eradicate and devote all of our energy to trying to master nature. Be- A, because it's futile. And B, because when, when we get absorbed in that project of trying to master nature, we actually deprive ourselves of an interpretive understanding of nature through which we could grow stronger of, of character, greater of soul, more self-possessed. So touching on this idea of, of how we're supposed to read, quote unquote, in air quotes, nature, you talk about um, you take shots at the Stoics and you take a lot, you take a lot of shots from the introduction of the book. You take a lot of shots at the Stoics and, you know, you know, full disclosure, like many people, here's, I have my copy here, a hold up of Marcus Aurelius, you know, yeah. and, uh, there he is. And, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I've read it many times and enjoy it, but you argue that the Stoics, you argue that they're wrong about a lot of things, but you say they're especially wrong about their view of nature. So what do the Stoics who are very hip nowadays, right? What do the Stoics have wrong? What do they get wrong about nature? The Stoics assume that nature is something external to us, ultimately, and central to the Stoic position is a sharp distinction between what we can and can't control. So what we can control are, to some extent at least, and the Stoics would say we should try to improve our control of these things that we can control, you know, our mindset, um, our emotions, um, our interpretations of things. So that we can control. What we can't control is is what's out there, and what's out there ultimately is nature in the form of the weather, in the form of the path of the stars, in the form of ultimately the fact of death that is embodied beings, we're, we're vulnerable to death. So the, the Stoics set up a duality between human agency on the one hand and the forces of nature on the other. And I think that's a mistaken duality. And the reason it's mistaken is that nature is always given to us in a certain interpretive frame. It's never simply external to us. Even the sense in which death, we might think, is inevitable, a fate to which we are subject, depends on our own interpretation of what death means. And if we define death simply as the dis- the destruction of, of the body after a certain point, well, yes, maybe. I mean, as an empirical matter, may- maybe that that is likely to befall us all um, insofar as any empirical claim is, is likely to be true. But it begs the further question of, well, what's the, the meaning of life? And, and is, is death really simply the demise of the body? And if we think about what it means for somebody to be present, present to us is presence defined simply by physical presence, you know, a person who walks and talks and is right before us who we can see and touch. Um, Is that what the presence of a person means? Or is presence something deeper? Does presence have to do with the with the, uh, the stories that we tell each other, you know, the moments that we share that are moments of insight, of, of counsel, of learning, of, of growing in each other's company. And if that's what it really means for somebody to be present, which I, I think it does, um, and we feel this very powerfully when somebody's absent, not in the sense of dead, but maybe they're, they're gone for a while, you know, they're in a different country. And paradoxically, we can become much closer to them in many ways at a distance when they aren't physically present because it gives us a certain distance through which we can interpret and gain gain a a deeper appreciation for who they are and what they mean to us. Um, If that's the case, then then presence can't simply be physical presence and death can't simply be the absence of somebody's presence. And to the extent that we define death as the absence of presence – we've just settled on a certain very partial contestable interpretation of death so that what we set up is some natural, you know, fact about the way the world is, um, really isn't such a natural fact. It, it is, it, it is permeated by our interpretation. And that I would say is, is true of every aspect of nature. So this distinction between kind of our mind, what we can control and what's out there in the external world that the Stoics rely quite heavily on is, is not right. Okay. Moving on, let's talk about 
contending with time. You have you ask here's another question about Odysseus. You ask this question, you say, is he older when he returns to Ithaca than when he sets out for Troy? <laughs> and again, we could be very stoic and say, well, of course, right? But that reminded me, there's that great Bob Dylan song, My Back Pages, where he says, you know, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. So we all have to engage with time. We can't get around it. But let's talk about that question you ask about Odysseus. Is he older when he returns to Ithaca than when he sets out for Troy? And, and how does that lead you into your conversation with the reader about how we're supposed to deal with time? Well, in an obvious f- familiar sense, well, if if his beard is grayer and his skin is more wrinkled, we say, well, of course he's older. Right. And But that won't do. That's not sufficient because we've decided to to define time simply by reference to certain states of the body. And it's even a mystery why we ascribe the term older to that physical change, that if we just look at physical states of the world around us, we'll never get to the sense in which time is passing or we're getting older. Uh, we look different. Maybe there's certain things, physical feats that, that we can't do anymore that we could do before. But to get from there to the claim that I'm growing old or that time is passing right. um, is actually quite difficult. Um, and you may not be able to get to that claim. I don't think you can simply from the observation of physical traits, but we're habituated into thinking of the passage of time by reference to the body in these ways. But time uh, is such a, a difficult concept and it's it's – a concept really that I've struggled with the most in the book. And my claim is that although we, we think of time in terms of sequence, one thing after the next, that's kind of a very basic familiar under familiar understanding of time. What, what is time except that some things happen before and after others, that that conception of time is a partial conception, that it rests on a deeper understanding of time that I try to articulate and that I think um, posing the question of whether Odysseus gets older or seemingly paradoxically get y- gets younger helps us, helps us illuminate. And when you think of life from the standpoint of meaning and from the standpoint of a personal narrative that has a certain trajectory – Time is experienced in a very different way because the end contains the beginning. In a way, Odysseus's return to Ithaca is a fulfillment of what he knew of himself all along. But it's not something that he could have had before this this terrible and marvelous adventure that that he he returns home, as, as we were talking about at the beginning, with something more, that home resonates in a new way. And if that's true, you could say, paradoxically, he becomes younger, precisely because he elicits the meaning that before hadn't yet been developed and unfolded. Um, so that uh, you, you could put it also in terms of maturity. He becomes more mature and older and wiser in that sense, but younger in the sense that he fulfills what was latent at the beginning. And so time takes on this kind of circular character, but it, but it's not, you know, a circle that returns to the same point. You could maybe, if you wanted to use a visual metaphor, think of like an upward spiral that's never ending, you know, where you're kind of returning to the the beginning, but at a higher level, you know, you go through things and you experience things and incorporate those experiences and those get taken up into the total meaning of your life and illuminate what was, what was implicit at the beginning. So that, so if he, so he becomes Odysseus 2.0, then 3.0 as he, as he spirals up there. I right? like that. Yeah. So, something like that. So, so how do we do that? Like, so how should we think about time then? How do, how do, you know, how do you become Adam 2.0 and Adam 3.0? It's an interpretive attentiveness to the things that matter to you. It's an attentiveness to cultivating self-possession and friendship and to appreciate nature as a partner along the lines that we've discussed and to, to i suppose if one were were to set oneself consciously to appreciating time in this way it, it would be it would start with not focusing so much on on the goals that lie ahead of you but but really trying to remember and to to take time out of your day to appreciate and to 
remember the path you've taken and the uh, the people who have mattered to you and, and who motivate you. Um, and we often we don't take the time to do that on a daily basis. You know, we're very caught up in the work day and we don't carve out that time, but, but that would be a, a good starting point. But yeah. ultimately I, I think that life, um, it, it just an attentiveness to opportunity and the willingness to take risks too, and to step into the unknown as a way of return, ultimately trusting that it's going to bring you back to yourself. Yeah, do you, do you have to, you know, and Odysseus is the greatest risk taker, you know, in literature, but it's that, that, that the idea of like a telos, right? Is that you have to, you know, to, to figure out what you're for, you have to take risks or you'll never know. Exactly. And the, the, the telos or the end is is something that is always unfolding, that it's not something that you have before your mind's eye here and now. Um, you might be able to articulate some dimension of it that could be immensely inspiring and meaningful, but that there's a, cert, a certain open-endedness to it. And that's what it means to face a future in the genuine sense that you are exposed to a kind of pervasive openness, that everything you know about yourself is held in a kind of suspension and indeterminacy. And, and that's very different from the goal-oriented future, which is defined by you know, a moment that you already see in advance, it may or may not come to pass because you may or may not succeed. And there's anxiety connected to that. And, you know, that's, that's the goal oriented future, but it's very different from what I would say is the future in the genuine sense of a radical openness to the unknown. And the way we achieve that radical openness is through just to read it's self-preservation, you know, friendship and, and, you know, interacting with nature. Yes, and that's really the the paradox that to be radically open to the unknown in that way, you have to have a sense of self and a sense of personal narrative and a, a sense of who you are and where your commitments lie. And only when you have that can you face the future and its radical openness. And I, I think it's captured very powerfully in statements we we say all the time, but don't necessarily think through or take the time to to think through. Um, when we say, for example, no matter what, I'm going to stand by your side. And on the one hand, it's, a, it's a, it's, it's the strongest certainty that can be had in the world, you know, a loved one who you're going to stand by. On the other hand, it, it invites, it tempts the future. And, and that statement only has meaning and weight. If you assume that the future is going to throw some obstacles in your way that you can't foresee. Yeah. Or a phrase that we hear all the time you, is, um, you know, we should live in the moment. We should live in the moment. Right. But what does that really mean to, what does that really mean to live in the moment? And I think that your book talks about that a lot in, in, in ways big and small. Yes. And, and the, uh, you know, we, there, there's a lot of talk of, of living in the moment and, and being present, but we, we need to, to think of the moment as a, a kind of, simultaneous closure or sense of self that's already established and at the same time a certain openness yeah. to the unknown and and in that sense to the extent we abide by that uh that insight we are always in the moment that that life in some sense is a single moment it, it's not um a series a series of moments or if you want to speak of a series that right. that every moment in the series is a simultaneous departure and return Right. It's only a series of moments if you're totally bought into the goal-oriented society. Right, right. because the moments are, are serial precisely right. because they're steps on the way to something that you foresee and, and you can measure time in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Adam, I have to tell you, it was so great talking to you today. I, I learned so much reading your book. I, I enjoyed every minute of it. The book is Happiness in Action, A Philosopher's Guide to the Good Life by Adam Adato Sandel. It's a great read. Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much, Dan. It was a real pleasure to be on the show, and uh, I really enjoyed it. It was uh, a real highlight of my day to be able to discuss these ideas with you. Great. Thank you so much. See you next time, everybody.